Let me invite you to open with me to Luke chapter 14. If you, by chance, did not receive a worship guide when you came in this morning, you will need the fold-out that's inside of there. And so if you didn't receive one of those, there's some ushers who are going to be walking down the aisles with some worship guides. Just kind of slip up your hand where you are, and they'll get you one. If you, by chance, did not receive one of those, just uh, please make sure to, to get one because you'll need that not only for our time in the Word, but some time we're going to have later. Just want to make sure everybody has that. I encourage you to pull that out and open up to Luke chapter 14. I'm going to do something a little different this morning. Every once in a while, we kind of come aside from our normal, our regular, intensive study in one particular passage of Scripture, um, just for some family time, for us as a faith family, and that's what I want us to do this morning, and I want to I share some things with you as your pastor that have been going on in my relationship with Christ. So let me, let me pray and start us that way. Father, I thank you for the privilege of leading this faith family. At the same time, I shudder at the thought of leading this faith family because I am so inadequate for the task. I'm not even adequate to lead my own family much less this family and believers. And so, God, from the very beginning, I express before them the depth of my need for Christ. I can do nothing without Christ. I am nothing without Christ. And I pray that you would give me grace communicate what Christ has been teaching me. I pray that I would speak nothing but the truth from Christ. And I pray for grace to communicate in a way that honors you. And I, I pray for grace for this body of believers to hear in a way that honors you. Give us grace, we pray today, to hear your word and grace to obey your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I want to share with you this morning some areas of disobedience that have been evident in my relationship with Christ. They are areas that I have confessed to my wife and my family and need to confess to you this morning. There are truths in Scripture that I have been avoiding and disobeying for the past months, I would, I would probably even say past years. Um, but very more intentional disobedience over past months. And uh, I want to be honest with you. I'm, I'm at a point, I would, I would probably call it a crisis of faith, crisis of belief point in my spiritual journey right now. And if I, could, if I had to summarize what that looked like, it really revolves around one main question. And the question is, do, do I believe this book? I mean, really. I, I preach this book. I love preaching this book. I teach this book. I study this book. I try to hide this word in my heart. But do I believe it? Do I really believe it? Because if I believe it, if this book is true, then that has radical implications for my life. 
And it's really the question I want to put before you then as a result. An all-important question. You've got this at the top of your notes. Do we believe this book? When this book says some of the things it does, do we really believe it? And Luke chapter 14 gives us a picture. I think if we believe this book, then, then it has radical implications for our lives and radical implications for this church. Kind of a, a summary verse. It's going to drive much of the next eight weeks that we have together in the Word. Luke 14, 33. This is Jesus speaking. I want you to listen to what he says. You might underline it. In the same way, any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. That's radical. Everything. And lest, lest you think, lest we think that that just means stuff, go back up to verse 26. Jesus says there, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. That's everything. And he says, you can't call yourself a follower of mine if you don't give up all these things. That's, that's radical. This is a picture of demands of the gospel. Give up everything you've got if you even want to consider being my disciple. That's what this whole passage is about, which we'll see next week. And, and so, this question, do I really believe this book, has really kind of come in three main areas. And I want to put them before you this morning. And I want to ask you the questions that uh, God has been asking me and convicting me about. You got them there in your notes. First question. Do we believe what this book says about the church? Do we believe, do we really believe what this book says about the church? And, and I, want, I want you to turn back just a few chapters to the left. Luke chapter 9. I want to show you this. This is an amazing passage of Scripture. And we're just going to hit on it real quickly. But do we believe what this book says about what it means to follow Christ? Listen to this. There's large crowds at this point that are following Jesus. And this is what happens. Luke chapter 9, verse 57. Listen to what it says. As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, him being Jesus, a man said to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus replied, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Kind of an interesting response. He said to another man, follow me. But the man replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead. But you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord. But first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. And Jesus replied, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Is that not amazing? Jesus seems to be talking these three guys out of following him. I've got, I've got to tell you this, just a, a side note. Um, I remember when I, when I first moved down to New Orleans, I went down there to study under uh, a particular professor who became a mentor for me, Jim Shaddix. And Dr. Shaddix invited me soon after I'd gotten down there to go to an event where he was preaching. It was a youth event. And he got there and he was preaching on this text. And he started the sermon. I'll never forget, I was sitting there. He started the sermon and he said, my goal tonight is to talk you out of following Jesus. And so then he preached the text. And then at the end, he gave an invitation for people to respond to Jesus. And all these, all these students came down to the front responding. And I was like, wow, that's pretty cool. Like, so I was preaching at a youth event the next week. And I thought, I'm, I'm going to try it, you know. <laughs> so, uh, so the next weekend, I, I get up. And it was like word for word. My, my goal tonight is to talk you out of following Jesus. And then I preached the text, and I, I got to the end, and uh, apparently I was more successful than Dr. Shaddix. Because <laughs> there were birds chirping in that room. Nobody was moving. I remember sitting there afterward, like, what happened? I thought, 
anyway, this is the picture. It seems like, it seems like Jesus is trying to talk these guys out of following him. I mean, this goes against our thinking. We, we think our whole picture today in the church is do whatever it takes to get them in. Whatever it takes, get them in. Jesus is saying, let the dead bury their own dead. Don't even go back and say goodbye to your family. These are the kind of things I wonder when the disciples heard if their jaws were just on the ground. Whenever the crowds would get big, he'd say things like, eat my flesh and drink my blood. And all of a sudden the crowds would leave and the disciples were like, what, what, are, you, what are you doing? Like, Jesus, we're never going to get on the list of fastest growing movements if you don't stop telling the crowds to eat you. This doesn't work. <laughs> but this, this is what he would do. What is he doing? Jesus, Jesus is telling us what it means to follow him. I, I want to put three questions in front of you again, just real quickly, that I think we, we need to think about when it comes to being a follower of Christ. If you call yourself a follower of Christ, this is what's involved. Question number one, will we choose comfort or a cross? Comfort or a cross? First guy. I'll follow you wherever you go. He's eager. Jesus says, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. And we find out in Matthew chapter 8, that this is a religious teacher, a religious leader. We find Jesus warning, Mark 12, 38 through 40, Jesus warns about guys like these. Because what they would do is, the, the pattern was, you would attach yourself to a religious teacher in order to promote or enhance your position and your status and your career. And so... So you'd, you'd follow a, another teacher to help promote you to the next level, to climb the ladder, so to speak. And so here you've got a guy who wants to follow Jesus as a means to an end. And this is a different picture. We're not Jewish culture trying to attach ourselves to Jesus to become greater teachers or climb the ladder. But how often, we've talked about this, this is the gospel we're selling today. Jesus is a means to an end. Come to Jesus so you can get forgiveness. And come to Jesus so you can get your best life. And come to Jesus so you can get heaven. And none of those things are true. You come to Jesus to get God. You don't come to Jesus to get stuff. We don't, we, we've, we've, we've taken it steps deeper. We come to Jesus so we can get a comfortable place to worship. And we come to Jesus so we can get activities for our kids to do. And we come to Jesus so we can get a, a good life in Birmingham, Alabama. No, you come to Jesus and you get him. He's the end. It's not a means to anywhere. He's everything. We don't want a comfortable place to worship. We don't want activities for kids. We don't want to promote ourselves. We want Christ. And this guy hears Jesus say, I don't even have a roof over my head. If you come to me, I'm all you've got. Do we want that kind of Jesus? Do we want comfort or do we want a cross? That's where Jesus is going. Luke, fe- Luke 9, 51 tells us. Second question, will we choose maintenance or mission? Maintenance or mission. Second guy, Jesus initiates the conversation with, follow me. The man replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. And Jesus says, let the dead bury their own dead. You go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Now, there are scholars who debate this whole deal. Some people believe that his dad was about to die. And he just wanted to go back, spend those last couple of days with his dad. And then give his father a proper burial, which is obviously something he would want to do. But even deeper than that was one of the highest of religious obligations. That a son honor his father. I mean, you, this is just a no-brainer son does this for his dad. Others believe his dad had just died. All he wanted to do was go back and bury his father. Then he'd come. First week I ever preached that part of the text, focusing on it, was the week that two days later my own dad passed away. And I remember thinking on what I had just preached on. I cannot imagine hearing the words from Jesus. Let Let somebody else bury your dad. Go and proclaim the kingdom of God. That just seems cold, doesn't it? Does that seem, I mean, let's be honest. That's harsh. That, this is the Jesus we're worshiping in this room, and he would say that. What is he saying? What is he doing here? He's saying that there is a, there is a responsibility, and there is an obligation that supersedes every other responsibility and every other ro- obligation in this world. Even the thing you would most want to do or most need to do, you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. It's far more important. Try telling Jesus that he's too focused on mission. Jesus, don't you, don't you care about us? We're talking about mission all the time. 
People say, well, we talk about mission all the time. What about us? Jesus says, don't even bury your dad. Go to mission. And the church will always, church as a whole, individuals and families all across this room, we will always face these two options, maintenance or mission, business as usual, status quo, or radical abandonment to proclaiming the kingdom of God. Will we choose maintenance or mission? Third, will we choose indecisive minds or undivided hearts? Indecisive minds or undivided hearts. Lord, let me just go back and say goodbye to my family. And he says, no one who puts his hand in the plow and looks back. You can't even look back. Don't even go say goodbye to mom. You see the indecision here? It's the indecision that has, it's the sinful indecision that has gripped me for these past months. Because when Jesus tells us to obey, at least in my own personal experience, I find myself asking questions. Well, is it safe? Well, is it wise, really? Is it, is it the time? What will this person think or that person think? How will this look? The reality is, if Jesus has said it, then a follower of Christ does it. Period. Period. I'm not saying we don't want to be wise, but wisdom is found in obedience to Jesus. Not in the world. An indecision hampers us, hampers me, from radical obedience to Christ, as opposed to an undivided heart. What scares me is the implication of Luke 9, 57 through 62 is that these guys don't follow Jesus. He succeeds in turning them away. What scares me is the thought of what I would do if I was one of those three guys. As I look at what we have done with what it means to follow Christ today, and I wonder if Jesus would move on and we'd still be standing there. And this, honestly, what does it mean to be a follower of this Jesus? I mean, really, what does it mean to be a Christian? What does Jesus expect of us? Empower us to do. Because the reality, what, what, is, what is expected of a Christian in Birmingham? Not a lot, really. Not a lot. The bar's pretty low. What's expected of a follower of Christ in Luke chapter 9? Everything. Luke chapter 14, everything. There's an urgency here. Why? It leads to the second question. Do we really want to know what it means? We believe what this book says about what it means to follow Christ. Second, do we believe what this book says about the lost? What this book says about the lost. Now, what we're going to do in the days ahead is we're going to look, this, this whole series, we're going to look at the Gospels, at words from Jesus. But I want to take us outside the Gospels for just a minute on this one. People who do not know Jesus, people who do not trust in Jesus for salvation, do we believe what this book says about them? Do we believe 2 Thessalonians 1.7? It's in your notes. Follow along. This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the majesty of his power. Everlasting destruction. Revelation chapter 20, verse 15. If anyone's name is not found in the, written in the book of life, thrown into the lake of fire. Earlier, same chapter, talks about how the smoke of their torment rises up forever and ever and ever. It begs the question, do we believe that? Do we believe that there is coming a day when those who do not trust in Jesus will be punished with everlasting, i.e. unending destruction? Door closed in the majesty of God forever. Instead, a lake of fire where the smoke of their torment burns forever and ever and ever without end. Do we believe that? Because if, if 
if we believe that, then that has radical implications for the way we live our lives and the way a church operates. And we've talked about this. The 6.7 billion people in the world today, the most liberal estimates would say about a third of those are Christian. And that's, that's people who claim to be Christian, socio-politically, socially. Politically, this whole picture, not necessarily all true followers of Christ, but let's just assume for a second. Let's assume even if all one-third of the people in the world today who claim to be Christian, let's assume all of them are actually followers of Christ, have actually walked down this road and said, yes, I'll, I'll abandon everything in Luke 9 and Luke 14. Even if all third of them are Christian, that still leaves over 4.5 billion people. Over 4.5 billion people, including hundreds of thousands in Metro Birmingham, today on a road that leads to an eternal hell. 4.5 billion people who today are standing under the judgment of God and are on a road that leads to an eternal hell. If that is true, if that's true, if we believe that, then we, we can't play games in the church. And we, we can't play games with our lives and our families. To be honest, we can't even think about what is best for our families because we need to think about what's best for the glory of Christ among people who are going to everlasting destruction where the smoke of their torment will burn forever and ever. If that's true, it radically changes the way we live. If that's not true, then we spend our resources on ourselves and we indulge ourselves in stuff around us. If this is true, you can't do that. It's impossible. Not if that's true. Not if we believe that's true. And you abandon everything to make the gospel known among the lost. So do we believe, do I believe what this book says about the lost? And that leads to the third question. Do we believe what this book says about the church? Do we believe what this book says about the lost? And third, and this is the question, this has probably pierced me in a, in a whole new way. Not probably, most definitely has. Do we believe what this book says about the poor? And here's the fact. Today, over a billion people live and die in desperate poverty. Live on less than a dollar a day. Close to 2 billion others live on less than $2 a day. For over a billion people, what it costs you or I to buy french fries, over a billion people do not have for food, water, shelter, clothing, and medical care today. The reality is, most of our dogs and cats are living on more than $2 a day. And close to 3 billion people don't have that much. Let me bring it down just today. 30,000 children today will breathe their last breath due to either starvation or preventable disease. Just, just try to put that. I, I, I try to think. 30,000 Joshua's and Caleb's today who will not be alive when we go to bed tonight because they had no food or no medical care for a disease that's preventable. 30,000 of them. It, bring that into our context. Look at it from this perspective. If that were happening here, it's almost a little bit appropriate, this is not the purpose, that a little bit appropriate that many of our children are not in this worship service this morning. I want you to imagine with me for a second, if that were happening here, that would mean that 
every single child, 18 years old or younger, in Shelby County, every single child would be dead by a week and a half from now. They'd all be gone. All of our kids. In a week and a half time. All of them gone. But here's the deal. We don't have to think about that. We don't have to think about that. This is not before us. We're not even, let's be honest, we're not even inconvenienced by that kind of extreme poverty because those stricken by it are not only poor, they are powerless. They're powerless. And we don't have to, we don't have to see them. We don't have to hear from them. We don't have to have anything to do with them. Literally millions of them are quietly dying in relative obscurity, and we can comfortably ignore them in our affluence, pretending like they don't even exist. That sounds cold, but ladies and gentlemen, it is, it is life here, isn't it? Are we concerned when we drive through this community about not having food or water, shelter? No, we're going to the store to get our kids or ourselves more, more stuff. We don't have to think about these. These are not realities that are before us. They can pretend like it's not even there. Meanwhile, they do exist. The reality is they do exist. And here's what frightens me. I've been in a journey from cover to cover in Scripture. And the reality is, God measures the integrity of our faith. And we're going to unpack this more. But God measures the integrity of our faith by our concern for the poor. It's all over Scripture. It's all over the place. God measures the integrity of our faith by our concern for the poor. He says to his people, Isaiah, clear picture. 56, 58, this whole picture of true fasting. God says, you're fasting, you're doing all your religious exercises. It means nothing if you ignore the poor. Nothing. It doesn't mean anything. You claim to know me. You turn a deaf ear to the poor. You don't know me. That's what he says to his people all the time. He measures the integrity of our faith by our concern for the poor. No concern for the poor. No integrity of faith. They go together. We take it a step deeper, though. And on a most serious note, not more serious note, on the most serious note, I think we could see in Scripture, Jesus tells those with abundance that if they do not feed the hungry and clothe the naked, they go to hell. Those with abundance, if you do not feed the hungry and clothe the naked, you go to hell. Hell. This is what Jesus teaches. The Jesus we're worshiping, he teaches this. We're gonna, we're gonna, again, we're going to dive into these passages in the coming weeks, but let me just give you an overview here. Old Testament leading up to when Jesus says that. Listen to Proverbs 14, 31. Those who oppress the poor insult their maker. You insult God. Church, people of God, you insult your God. You turn a deaf ear to the poor. Proverbs 21, 13, and there's a misprint, misprint in your notes, and it's a huge misprint, so pay attention close. It's like the adversary snuck this in. Listen to this. If a man shuts his ears to the cry of the poor, he too will cry out and not be answered. What you've got in your notes is the way we live. What you've got in the Bible is the way God's designed it. What he says there, if a man shuts his ears to the cry of the poor, he too will cry out and not be answered. You shut your ears to the cry of the poor, you pray, you got nothing. doesn't even hear you. You gather together every Sunday, not even heard, Proverbs 21 says, so you're shutting your ears to the cries of the poor. Talking to yourself. These are strong words. Proverbs 28, 27, he who gives to the poor will lack nothing. It's a great phrase. But he who closes his eyes to them receives many curses. Cursed of God. Cursed by God if you, if you close your eyes to the poor. Luke 6, Jesus says this. Luke 6. These are Jesus' words. Luke 6, 20 to 25. This is the beginning and the end of that passage. Jesus says, blessed are you poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. 
Blessed are you that hunger now, for you shall be satisfied. Woe to you that are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you that are full now, for you shall hunger. James 5.1 takes it even deeper than a woe. Listen to this. Come now, you rich. Weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Can I remind you something? We are rich. Like all of us. Without exception. Even if you're a five-year-old in this room, you're rich. Like you have food. You have water. You have clothing. You have shelter. Rich. So, we're all rich. And the Bible says, come now, you rich. Weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Is this stern? It's even sterner. Matthew 19, 21 and 23. Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions. This is a passage we're going to study a couple of weeks. And give to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When the young man heard this, he went, he went away sad because he had great wealth. And Jesus said to his disciples, I tell you the truth. It is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, did you catch that? We're all rich. And Jesus says, it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Put it together. Jesus says it's hard to go to heaven from Birmingham, Alabama. It's hard for people in this room, including myself. It's hard for us to go to heaven. Very, very hard. It's hard to get to heaven from Birmingham. Matthew 25, 41 is where he says, and this is a passage Whatever you did to one of the least of these, you did to me. Jesus says, for those who do not feed the hungry and clothe the naked, he says these words, depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. If you don't feed the hungry or clothe the naked, then Jesus says to you, depart into eternal fire. So maybe this is not just about other people who were concerned about fire. Maybe there's a concern that needs to be had in this room about eternal fire. I don't believe I'm overstating this. Not based on the words of Jesus. Now follow me here. Follow me. We're going to dive into this passage, but just suffice to say at this point, this is not a passage that is teaching. It's undercutting the rest of Scripture and saying anything different than that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. Period. We know that. It's Scripture. No question. But I want you to think back. Remember we spent some time in 1 John looking at assurance of salvation, the fruit of Christ in our lives. Remember we talked about that? We said if the love of Christ is not in someone, then there's reason to question whether or not Christ is in someone. If the truth of Christ is not in someone, if they're speaking lies about Jesus, then there's reason to question whether or not Christ is in there. If someone is walking in disobedient, persistent sin and does not turn from that sin, what we talked about, Remember, and, and I, would, I would even say again, if, if you were here this morning, you were to come to me, and you were living in willful, disobedient sin against God, and you were to say, but I'm a Christian, I would look at you and I would say, based on, I believe on the authority of Scripture in First John, I would say, among other places, I would say, I do not know whether or not you are saved. It is certainly not my place to determine that. At the same time, I would, I would encourage you to ask very seriously whether or not Christ is really in you if you are living in deli deliberate disobedience to him. If there is deliberate disobedience in your life, it is persistent, there's reason to question whether or not Christ is in you. So bring that into this picture. If this is what Jesus' word says, and we live with so much stuff, then there's reason to question whether or not Jesus is really in us. This, this is huge. It's a, it's, a, it's a blind spot, really. That's kind of, as I've been thinking and praying through this, it's a blind spot. And here's what I mean by that. You know, 200 years ago, there were seeming men of God who were preaching the gospel, and they had slaves. We sit here like, how could you have slaves? 
you're preaching this gospel. Makes no sense. It's a needed corrective. You say, of course they shouldn't have had slaves. Not if they believe this gospel. Not if they preach it. I wonder. I wonder if 200 years from now, if Jesus does not come back, if they will look back at us and they will say, how could they follow Jesus and have so much stuff? How could they know this gospel and live in such nice houses and drive such nice cars and have such nice clothes and things? This is the blind spot that Christ has been opening my eyes and my heart to. It's come to this conclusion that I want to put for you in my life and I believe in the life of this church. It is time to get radical. It is time to get radical. You say, Dave, what do you mean by that? I don't know. I don't know all that this means for my life and my family. We're, we're in a journey right now where we are beginning to identify some things, some major things that this means. But I don't know what all this looks like in my life and my family. And so I certainly wouldn't go far as to say I know what this looks like in your life or your family. Or even what this looks like for us as a faith family. What I want to do is I want to invite us to go on a journey. Over the next eight weeks, where we listen to the words from Jesus. The Jesus we claim to follow, but words that we obviously have ignored. And I want us to listen to them. And I want us to consider together in our lives and our families across this room what these words look like in action in our lives. I don't think we can even begin to think through what this looks like for us as a faith family. Dive into that until we've gone through this fiction where we're saying, okay, what does it mean to follow this Christ? What does it mean to live radically for the lost? What does it mean to live radically for the poor? If what this book says is true. Now, the reality is, some of you, maybe, maybe many of you, w w are not excited right now about this journey. We have, we have a crowding issue in this room, and, and this may solve it. I know, I, I know that we live in a church culture that, let's be honest, likes to enjoy our football on Saturdays and get through a nice easy Sunday so we can go on with the rest of our week. And this is not tolerable with this word. It's not possible with this word. God, deliver us from artificial battles on Saturday that keep us from facing the real battles on Sunday morning. And I know, I know that there are probably people who will say, I'm out. I don't want to go on that kind of journey. I don't have to go on that kind of journey. I can live my Christian life without that kind of journey. That is an option. I would plead with you. I'd plead with you not to go there. But some, some of you may. And I, I want to be very careful here. Because obviously what we've seen is that Jesus is at some level okay with that. And he'd say these things and the crowds would leave. He was left with 12 people. That doesn't scare me. The thought of like 12 people here next week. <laughs> Will you believe this book, Dave? And I want to be really careful here because the last thing I want to do 
I'm saying that some may leave. It just sounds cold or insensitive. Some people might say unwise. I want to lead this faith family in this way. Please hear this. Not because I hate this church. It's because I love this church. And what, what frightens me, and it's what I've seen, it's what I'm repenting of, what frightens me is we don't have to go this route. There's plenty of other routes before us to go. In fact, other routes that I actually believe would make us more successful in the contemporary picture of church that we have created. But in the process of being successful, we would waste our lives and waste the church. And we'd be successful here and in the world to come for billions and billions of years. We'd have realized how foolish we were. So, I want to invite you to go with me. It's, it's, not, it's not, none of us likes to think about changes in our lives, changes in our families, changes in the church. None of us, including myself. And if, if we turn a deaf ear to 30,000 kids today who are dying of starvation or preventable disease, then we don't need to make any changes. That's fine. We can do this. But if we're going to live for the sake of 4.5 billion lost people, including hundreds of thousands in Birmingham, and thousands and thousands and thousands of kids who are dying every day because they don't have food on their table, then that means radical change in our lives and our families and the church. Again, I don't know what all that looks like. And so here's what I want us to do this morning. I want us to spend some time with the Spirit of God and the Word of God as individuals and families across this room. And I, I know even doing this, even doing this, some would say, don't do this on a Sunday morning. People will get up and leave. Well, you know, I know there's a tendency in which many people come into a room like this and think that there's a show that will happen and once the show is over, then we'll leave and I guess, I guess the show's over at this point. And we're going to dive into the Word. And if you have come to encounter God, I want to invite you over the next few moments. What we're going to do is you've got in your, in your fold-out picture, there are three different passages of Scripture. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to read each passage of Scripture. I'll read one, and then we're going to have some time to reflect on that passage. Then I'm going to read another, and we'll have time to reflect on it. We're going to do that with three different passages. These guys are just going to play in the, in the background. And I want to invite you. These are all passages that we're going to study in the weeks to come. But I want to invite you this morning to listen to them and to begin to reflect on them and begin to pray through them. So turn with me to Luke chapter 14. Turn with me to Luke chapter 14. Verse 25. Um, I'm going to read this passage and then give you a few moments to write out answers. Since again, this is just between you and God. There's not, not like this is going to be taken up or anything. Um, for you to spend some time. And if you get finished with those questions before we move on to the next chapter, then let me encourage you. Next passage, let me encourage you just to spend time in praying over that text and praying over those responses to those questions. So Luke chapter 14, verse 25. Read along with me. I want you to picture yourself in the crowds. Picture yourself in the crowds hearing this take place. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus. So you're in the crowds. And turning to them, he says, so turning to you, he says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Will he not first sit down and estimate the cost to see if he has enough money to complete it? For if he lays the foundation and is not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule him, saying, This fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Will he not first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, 
Any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is fit neither for the soil nor for the manure pile, and it is thrown out. He who has ears, let him hear. God, we pray for grace to consider your words honestly, humbly, clearly during these moments. We invite you to take those questions and begin to write out answers to them, reflect on them, pray through them. As you finish up those questions, I want to invite you to turn me over to Matthew chapter 9. If you weren't able to finish those questions, then please, please let this be fuel for your time with the Lord this week. Even if you were able to finish those questions, let this be fuel for your time with the Lord this week. Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. This is another passage that we are going to study during this series. And here's what I want you to do as we read these words. I want to invite you to picture Jesus' demeanor, countenance, to try to picture what this looked like. These words, let them kind of come alive and see this. And then we'll answer these questions. Verse 35. Picture this, Jesus going through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogue, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. And when he saw the crowds, see his eyes, he had compassion on them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. And listen to his voice. He said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. With that picture in your mind, I invite you to answer the questions. Reflect on the questions. Pray through the questions that are below. Matthew 9, 35 through 38. One final passage. Again, I know that it's probably too much to encapsulate all those questions. I would encourage you, let this fuel your walk with Christ this week. Luke 18, though, I want you to turn there with me. This passage we've already referenced, we're going to spend a couple of weeks on in this series. We have talked about how all of us in this room without exception, are rich. And so, I want to invite you to put yourself in the shoes of this man. And I want you to, from his perspective, imagine this scene. You go up to Jesus. A certain ruler asked him, verse 18, Luke chapter 18, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother. All these I have kept since I was a boy, he said. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, you still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When he heard this, he became very sad because he was a man of great wealth. Jesus looked at him and said, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. And indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard this asked, Who then can be saved? Jesus replied, What is impossible with men is possible with God. Peter said to him, We have left all we had to follow you. I tell you the truth, Jesus said to them, No one who has left home or wife or brothers or parents 
or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will fail to receive many times as much in this age and in the age to come eternal life. Based on that passage, I invite you to reflect on these questions. Answer them, pray through them. As you finish up, I'm going to wrap those questions up for now. I want to invite you to put that away, and I want to invite you to stand with me. And I want us together as a faith family around this room stand together in, in, in a couple of things one in, in light of what I've shared with you this morning I want to ask ask you for your forgiveness for my disobedience in some of these areas of my life for turning a deaf ear to these truths and the implications thereof but at the same time, I want to ask you for your prayers for me, for my family. Hebrews 13, 7 haunts me. Remember your leaders, it says, consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. So basically, the picture is God sets up leaders in his church to be imitated, to be a demonstration of the word. And, and I want... I want to, to show you what this looks like in action, and I don't know all that looks like, and so I won't in any way claim to be perfect in that. That's why I'm asking you to pray for me and for Heather and our family, that God would give us great grace to know how to lead in this way, in a way that shows these truths, and I want you to know that I'm, I'm going to be praying for you. I want us to be praying for each other. There's no easy answers here. It doesn't say... Okay, well, this is how it looks in your budget to care for the poor, and this is how it looks in your schedule to care for the lost. I think the whole purpose of this journey and these commands is designed to bring us on our faces before Christ for him to show us what that looks like because the picture is, and I don't want you to forget this, he's the goal. The goal is not even the lost or the poor. The goal is Christ. We want Christ. And he's, he's the center that drives us. And this is the whole beauty of this thing. Because when he's the center, then anything that even begins to seem like sacrifice is no longer sacrifice. Because the one who died on a cross and rose from the grave and ascended on high and is given eternal life freely to us, he's the goal. And so nothing seems like sacrifice in light of Christ. So... Let's fix our eyes and our hearts on him. That's what we're going to do in song and prayer this morning. We're going to say, Christ wants you to be the center of our lives and center of our families and center of this church. We want you to drive us. And we want you more than anything else.